I'll tell you a story about that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, my daughter's running pretty well at San Luis Obispo High School, and I, I think I know everything about running. So, you know, I talk to her more and more about, you know, running and racing and everything. Life. No, running. We're just talking <laughs> okay, about running. Okay. <laughs> and um, I'm too stupid to realize that the more I talk, the worse she races. Mm-hmm. Finally, at about a month into this, I pull her aside and I said, let's go to dinner. So we go to dinner and uh, I said, sweetie, I think I'm stressing you out. And she goes, you are with a giant F and some other letters stressing me out. Stop it. Stay away. And I haven't talked to her about running since. Hello, runners. Welcome to episode two of Mr. Rubio Used to Run. It's a running warehouse podcast where we talk about all kinds of things about running, shoes, training, athletes. Sometimes we talk about things that aren't related to running. Uh, my name is Joe Rubio. I'm the head proprietor. Also, we have Connor. Connor? That was really well thought out. I wow. like that intro. <laughs> How long did that take? Uh, the walk over here from okay. my office. Yes. Good. Yes. So what do we have on, on deck well, today? Well, the burning running mystery we're addressing today, foams. Ooh. So I look on the internet all the time at all kinds of podcasts and YouTubes, and everyone is talking like people know what these foams are, right? Right. So we're going to discuss- It's very simple stuff. It is very simple stuff. No, it actually isn't very simple stuff. (laughs) So if you can just describe the three basic categories of foams. Okay. Okay. So- this, okay. Or just so, introduce them. Yeah, I, so, I think we have EVA. Right. We got EVA. Right. You've got TPU. Right. And then the next one is a little bit more. We've got supercritical foam. Right. So that is like a, a PIBA. Yeah. It can be PIBA. It could be TPE. Right. A lot of fancy, but we can get in a little bit more on what that is. But it's a specific type of uh, application that's used on these foams. And then the fourth is kind of these blends of EVA blends and certain things where you're taking uh, compounds and mixing them together to make these like... Right. That's like a nitro is kind of like that, right? uh, It would would be like a power run foam. Okay. Yeah. So where you're taking EVA, maybe mixing in like a TPU. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Right. So let's just start with EVA. This stuff was invented in 1975. And for all intents and purposes, there's nothing really that changed with it. So this is what you started with. Yeah. So this is what I started with. And the stuff was okay. It was not great. Uh, but it was relatively inexpensive. Uh, it had some cushioning properties. Uh, but it didn't really change much. It still hasn't changed significantly uh, without any additives. So, um, I mean, it lasted for a long time because yeah. it did the job. It got the job done. It was but somewhat durable, somewhat cushioned. Somewhat. But, you know, if you get a regular EVA shoe, the thing's going to be done at about 150 miles. So this stuff you read about shoes lasting 300, 500 miles, a bunch of crap. Well, and and that's the thing. Do they last? Sure. But are they going to feel good? Usually these EVA foams after 150, 200, you notice, at least it, when you put them on side by side, there's a difference. Right. Now, the, the advantage is they're inexpensive. Yes. Right? And they've been around for a long time, and they tend to be stable and those kinds of things. They're easy but, to make. They're easy to make. But you get them in cold weather, and you lose up to 60 to 70% of your cushioning properties with that thing. Okay, so and it you've is. You've lived in San Luis Obispo. Yeah, your whole so, life, so you are very used to cold weather. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think a lot of people know that. So, yeah. you know, as an example, um, we're getting a little, I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves, but, uh, you know, the new Triumph 20 yep. competes with the Nimbus 25. Well, the Nimbus 25 is EVA based, so it's going to lose more of its cushioning properties than the Triumph 20, which is TPU based. Right. So, At the same time, though, then we will have to go into the specifics, yeah. but the Nimbus does use Has, an uh, EVA oh, mixed with an OBC. OBC, another which, a acronym. Lot, a lot yeah. of acronyms here, but yeah. It does it does affect things. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, it won't be your traditional EVA. Right. People are moving forward, but yeah, there's always going to be those trade-offs. And with TPU... Yeah, we can go with TPU. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the benefits of TPU are it's going to feel good for a lot longer. So mile one versus mile 200, it feels fairly in line. Right. And this stuff lasts forever. Lasts forever. But But (laughs) it's heavy. heavy. Yeah, exactly. So you get a boost right now. And the reason no one runs in uh, Ultra Boost anymore is because it's it's heavy. Yeah. It's really heavy. And so you need to add an additive in there to make it lighter. But still, a TPU midsole is going to last a very long time. Uh, But it's also uh, heavy. 
and it is not affected by cold weather nearly as much. No. No. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's slightly more expensive, but it's it's a kind of depends on what you want. So if your shoe, if you're looking for a shoe that weight isn't as big a concern, then TPU is a, a very good choice. Yeah, and you throw with Boost. Yeah. That's a beaded TPU. Right. So you think of a bunch of pellets all um, smushed together. Right. That pellet form actually makes it even more durable. So Boost is fantastic. You see people put hundreds and hundreds of miles. And there are some additives that Adidas has tried to make the light boost. And they're, they are able to make it lighter. They are able to change the properties. Right. But it is hard to get that that really nice feel of that original boost. So, again, it'll be interesting to see where Adidas moves. We've already seen some new foams that well, we saw we'll it, talk in later. Yeah, but, we, yeah, we saw one day before yesterday with, you know, 211 Women's Marathon World Record with the newest adidas foam but i mean we can go into that now i mean piba or those types of foams okay. are yeah. uh well tpu is uh, introduced by adidas and ultra boost in 2017 or 2013 right and then 2016 saw nike come out with zoom x yeah so just in terms of rebound uh eva is going to be roughly 65 percent um ultra boost going to be 75 percent and then you get to piba and you're talking 85, 90, upwards of 95% energy return. So it's just, this stuff's insane. Um, the negative is it's very expensive and it tends not to last. So remember when we got our first 4% in here yep. and everyone went to try them on and the problem was they creased immediately. So we couldn't sell them, right? They were used. I mean, they didn't last very long at all. Right. Um, and what people, uh, what Nike was originally calling the Vaporfly, which a lot of people don't know, yeah. the Mayfly, yeah. which was a shoe that was supposed to last, what, 60 kilometers? Something like that. Something yeah. real low amount. So the Vaporfly was never meant to last. And I think maybe we're even getting a little ahead of ourselves. So these are going to be your super critical foams. Yes. So super critical is a technology, um, or it's a, it's almost like a design process. You can make super critical EVAs, um, PIBAs, TPEs. And what super cr critical actually means is, and I, I always refer back to Kurt, our yep. favorite from Skechers. Yeah, Skechers, because they, they were the first to market it, and they use CO2 right. in, in EVA. Right. And yeah, so Hyperburst was the first kind of mainstream super critical foam. It was a super critical EVA. And how he would describe it was they take a little baby part. So it would be basically uh, an EVA um little small piece it was a small thing and like i have a, a key fob it's like the yes. size of a key fob exactly right and you would put that in what in essence is a pressure cooker right you'd throw them in you'd add in co2 and nitrogen this is gas gas can't get into this little baby part because it can't penetrate so you add heat that co2 and nitrogen turns into a super critical state which is between a gas in a liquid, it injects itself in. Now it's basically a saturated sponge. You take away the heat, you normalize conditions, that super, that super critical liquid turns into a gas again, pop, explosion, you get the midsole. Yeah, which is really cool. So it, it makes it softer and lighter, right? More responsive. More responsive, uh, but it's a more expensive process. Yes, it's so, hard to do. It's right. not It's, it's not, not something not you can mass right. produce as easily. And, um, who Hoke is doing with the next mock? I think the mock six is the next one. They have a, a they have a super, super critical, critical EVA, EVA. Yep. right? And in a similar, pro I think it's a similar process. It's the OBC that A6 uses. Is that the same? Pro so I don't the, know if that's a super the critical. The OBCs or just get into so that that would be the the final one right. where it's that fourth. It's EVAs mixed with different compounds. So you'll see EVAs mixed with TPUs with like Power Run. EVAs mixed with OBCs. And this is like almost mixing two compounds together to get like some benefits of both. And I think you were, you were talking about some analogies yeah. with well, this. I mean, um, I probably drink too much, which everyone <laughs> knows, but, um, so gin is a pretty popular drink. And in fact, I was talking to Jasmine just a moment ago and she loves a dirty martini, right? She does. And I said, did you know, uh, gin is actually starts out as vodka. You add juniper berries have that sit for a day or two, and then you add some sort of botanical. Could be mustard seeds, it could be spruce, I don't know, you can add wood chips, I don't know. But it changes, and it's, it's a different recipe depending on how you want the gin to end up. And this is what happens with these different foams. Everyone says, you know, it, it 
isn't lively. Well, it wasn't designed to be lively, right? And we, we can look at stuff like, like Zoom X, and we don't have anything written that says this, but there's no way the Ultrafly and the Alphafly have the same midsole. They're both called Zoom X. One's going to be PIBA, so their high-end racing stuff's going to be PIBA. And the problem is people bought this high-end racing stuff, and they started complaining and bitching and moaning because the stuff didn't last. Well, it wasn't designed to last. But then uh, Nike got so many complaints, okay, let's make something that lasts longer. So my, my guess is it's a TPE, right? So it's responsive, but it's heavy, and it isn't as bouncy as the PIBA. Right. Yeah, probably Invincible has that too. Invincible, probably the Ultrafly. And yeah, you're, you're right, the durability. But I think also for daily training, there are different purposes. Right. So the Invincible, it needs to be a little bit more stable. Maybe, right. It might even be a little more dense. We don't know exactly, but there are different formulations that give different feels and for different uses. Right, and you got fresh foam. You There's got fresh def- foam. definitely different fresh foams. Fuel cell. Fuel cell, right? You know. But the fresh foam on the more... It's not going to be the fr- fresh one on uh, these other models. I mean, the thing is just way too soft, right? Right. Right? It just depends on what you want the end result to be. Right. Right? And um, anyways, you, you just go, uh, you know, that, that's the start of what is the experience you want with the shoe? Yeah. And then which material allows that to happen? I mean, that's the, the basics of it. And then when you have a, a runner that is complaining on running shoe geeks about, one, the shoe didn't last very long. Well, no, no. No, duh, it's an EVA midsole, right? And so it's going to wear out in 150 miles, right? And so, you know, and the other thing is you get, um, I read about, you know, people buying shoes off of eBay. Yeah. Okay, fine. They're inexpensive and they're authenticated. Now, the problem is when you have a PIBA midsole, like a racing shoe, so you buy a once used Alpha Fly for half price off of eBay. You don't know if that person has had that shoe in the back of the car in Phoenix summer out in the sun, right? Baking. Because you've had experience with Piva shoe that's been out in the sun. Oh, yeah. And they, they'll, they'll crack. They'll, there's, it's not good. No, it's not good. And the whole thing is you want that experience of the pop, right? Yeah. And, but that pop is not there for very long, and you can mess it up easily. Yeah. But on the new, with the on racing shoe, it says good for up to four marathons. I mean, that's about it. Right. Right. On, on any of these high end racing shoes. And the new Adidas shoe, you can't forget about yeah. 500 bucks. 500 bucks. One use. One use. Right. My guess is you might be able to get a little bit more right. in, but the, the performance is probably going to go down substantially right. and, after and one. You run in the shoes longer than, you know, they're. Oh, yeah. But you you run enough shoes to notice, notice the difference. Right. Right. It doesn't have that, that pop like it does. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, like going back to TPU. You know, someone says, well, why would I want a shoe that's not as poppy and heavier? Well, sometimes you want to just slow down on a run. You want to have athletes not run super hard on the, these things, right? And then you have the added thing of, you know, you have these super shoes, and now we have super trainers, right? And so you have these high-end foams, which is all fine, but then you add a plate to it. And all these high-end racing shoes have plates. And basically, you're immobilizing your foot, right? So over time, you would think your lower leg would get weak, and there is an uptick with elite athletes getting injured in their lower legs. It's good, there's going to be more of that. And if you think about it, these are the athletes that actually spent five or ten years running without plates. So they have pretty strong lower legs. And then they jump into the shoes and the times have just gone crazy. Yeah. Now what happens when you have somebody that's been all they do exclusively is be in these shoes with a plate. I'm guessing we're going to see a leveling of times and so forth. You know, the other thing is you look at the, the technology, we're about as played out in foams as we can get. Yeah. You can't go past 100. You can't go 11 on these things. Right. And you say that, and I agree, but at the same time, you know, we, we've we seen almost a leveling over the past few years of a lot of the brands getting very in line. Right. And then Adidas comes out with this shoe and nearly, you know, it's a sub five ounce shoe at the same stack. So they were able to create an even lighter foam. So I think now it's just going to be a, a lot more incremental. But well, well, what about the shoe that Eric got today? Yes, our, uh, our, head, our head buyer got a pretty special shoe today yeah, from and, Hoka. Yeah, it, it's, it's insane. It's what? It, it's got sub eight ounce. Sub eight ounce. It's got a fully trail lugged outsole. Yeah, yeah it's nearly really, max. really cool, right? Yeah. It's actually uh, Decker's Lab. Yes. Is a, is a shoe. And, and it, supposedly it was a shoe that Jim Walmsley ran. Right, at least part of UTMB. And whoever got fifth at, at UTMB. Yeah. 
uh, ran it as well. But, you know, we're talking, that's where it's going to go. We're going to get lighter. We're going to get higher stacks because, I mean, if it's me, I'm making everything at 50 or above and making 40, it white. 40 for, for racing. But, but it doesn't, I mean, if and I'm a manufacturer, why does it matter? That I is mean, true. I mean, you're making a shoe for maybe 25 people. That is right? true. Instead of, you know, I, I don't even know why golf clubs have to stay at that, that size, right? Make them bigger. You yeah. know, it's not like these people are going to play in the PGA. They can't even spell PGA, but anyways. I've seen I've seen your swing. You might be there one of these days. <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Ah, <laughs> uh, geez. All right. So when you talked a little bit about super trainers yep. with plates, I think that's another important thing to go into because we're seeing it more and more. Now it's like every brand is like, do we need the plate? Do we need a super trainer with a plate? And, you know, there, there's times and places for these, like you said, but at the same time, I don't think it's an everyday thing. This no. is something that you can add in as a tool. Yep. But the plates every single day, I, I don't know if that's no. the way to go. Uh, um, you know, the thing is, I think there's a place for like the Cielo Road, yep. right? Which has a super foam. Yep. It's a lower stack. It doesn't have a plate. So something like that on doing your quarters or your mile reps would probably be a good thing, right? I mean, it reminds me of the old days with the A6 Hyperspeed. No one really raced in that shoe, but they everyone worked out in that shoe because it was great. It's like 75 bucks, right? It was no frills. You just got the job done, right? And I think that's where the seal road fits in. Right. And the other thing, too, I don't think anyone's really nailed the, the ball out of the park with the, the 5K, 10K racing shoes. No, and we've seen some... Uh some images leaked on Instagram of what could be a streak fly prototype some by some Nike right. athletes. And it looks Look. very interesting. So I think the brands are starting to realize there's still a play there. Right, for, for sure. I mean, but the, you know, the fact of the matter, everyone's racing in high stack right. racing flats to run their PRs, even in the, you yeah. know, even in the, the 5k. Which tells me no one's nailed it. Yet. Nobody's nailed it yet. Yeah. Right. And anyways, yeah. so. What else you got? All right. So, okay. We're talking about super foams. Mm -hmm. We're talking about these super critical foams, the performances they've got it. And now we've seen the world record in the women's marathon go down. We've seen pretty much every track distance record go down. And this all happened after PIBA foams, super critical foams were introduced. How much of an impact are these foams playing? <laughs> are, are, we, are we saying that these are the reason for the records? Are the training getting smarter? Are there other factors involved? Well, I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, <laughs> some performance enhancing drugs here or there, you know. Um, in fact, we, we, I, won't, we won't call uh, anyone specifically out. No, we're not going to call anybody specifically out. But, it's you possible. know, the, sh- the shoes certainly help. Yeah. Right? Um, and if that 4% actually holds up, yep. and I don't think it applies to, to track, but look at 4% for a four minute mile, that's 9.6 seconds, right? And I was talking with Ryan Van Hoy, the head coach at Cal Poly. Um, we're supposed to have a beer tomorrow, by the way. Okay. Yeah, I'll see if I can get him on the podcast at some <laughs> point. But um, You heard it here first, maybe our first guest. Maybe our first guest. <laughs> uh, perhaps one of his athletes too. Okay. But um, I was congratulating him because last winter he had two athletes break four minutes in the mile. I said, hey, congratulations, coach. He goes, sub four now is not four, sub four seven years ago. He's not the same, oh. right? And, you know, in fact, uh, track and field news stopped keeping track of sub four-minute miles because it's just like ludicrous. You got eighth grade boys breaking four minutes in a mile, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe a little maybe bit of a stretch, a, yeah. but I mean, how many high schoolers broke four this year? I don't know, like a, eight. A lot. Yeah. I mean, and before it was like, how long did it take Alan Webb to join the club? It yeah. took like 30 or 40 years. It took forever, Yeah. right? It just, it, it's not the same, but, you know, it does allow you to train harder. Yep. Right. Long runs and stuff like that. It's just there's a time and place for everything. So does every long run need a super trainer? No. I mean, if you're doing a 14 or 16 mile or B- BFD, just use a regular shoe. Yep. But if you start getting into marathon specific stuff and you're going 18 to 20 and 22 with some of it at pretty good clip. Yes. Wear those shoes so you can recover and you can hit the times. But every workout. No, don't do that. Well, and from a training perspective, the, the things that I hear from my teammates, yeah. Uh, other pros and just my own experiences is you hit these hard workouts. Some days, you know, you might go out for a five by mile, right. really pound. And back in the day, if you wore racing flats, you were dead. You were for a couple of days, you weren't walking. Yeah, you're quite. right. Now you actually feel pretty good yeah. and you're running the same times, if not maybe a little bit faster. Yeah. And then with that same thing, you know, back in the day, you had a five by mile workout and you want to go sub five. Right. You push a little bit and you might dip under for all of them. Now you do the same effort, but it's not, you know, you're not pushing as hard. So it might even help athletes hit some faster times that they think they can do. Yeah. 
and maybe not push as hard. Yeah. So going back to the original thing, you know, what's causing all the fast times? Yeah. Footwear is definitely a big thing. Yeah. Right. And, you know, when I started coaching, the internet didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds funny, but it didn't exist. So right now you have access to pretty much everyone's training on the planet. Right. You know, one of my favorite links is I have Schumacher's training from, I don't know how many years ago. And I look at that and I have, uh, Warhurst, he's the legendary coach from Michigan. I have his stuff, yep. and you have all the stuff. But before you had to look at books, yep. and then you had books like How They Train. And Ivan Huff was in this How They Train, and I said, "Which week?" He said, "My best week of my life." Right. Yep. So he put something that wasn't quite how he normally trained. And Ivan Huff, yeah. if people don't know, yeah. running warehouse uh, employee Craig Huff, who is an Aggie. Yeah. He's an Olympic trials uh, competitor. Yeah. His uncle. His uncle. And he ran 816. He was the fourth fastest American steeplechaser at the time. Yeah. So, uh, but at, back then, you would, there wasn't a lot of information. And America sucked. We sucked. We were horrible at distance running, particularly marathon. And this was in the 90s. Yeah. And I got a hold of a guy named Frank Horwell. And Frank in, in, invented multi-pace training. So he gave that program to Peter Co. His son, Seb, is in charge of world athletics or whatever, won a couple gold medals and a couple world records and stuff like that. But, you know, at the time, everyone just ran easy mileage and not very much of it. Yep. And uh, I started writing on the Internet about multi-pace training, which made sense to me. And people started writing to me. And I started communicating with all these coaches. And that's how a lot of this stuff came about. But right now, if you are a bad coach, distance running, it's it, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, there's just so much information out there yeah. on the basics of, of what to do. And maybe the only negative with how much information is, there's a lot of information, right. good, and there's there's some bad stuff out there too. So trying right, to, for sure. to weed out the, the right stuff can yeah. also be. Um, but we can go into some coaching stuff. I mean, okay. um, I'll well, answer, what do you got? I'll answer the internet. <laughs> okay. So if on the- Wait, wait, wait. What? What, what is this segment called? Joe answers the internet. Okay. Okay. It's official. It's official. <laughs> um, Let's see, on the Cross Country Coaches Network, which is a group of people on uh, Facebook. They might be other places, but this is where I found it. Mike Coombs asks, uh, if I butchered your name, I'm sorry. Uh, dynamic warm-up slash stretching, what do you do? What do you think is a must-do? What do you think is overrated? So the short answer is dynamic warm-up is always part of the warm-up. It's not part of the cool-down necessarily. Static is when you're absolutely done and it's for injury prevention. So that's the short answer. But it brings up a larger, what, coaching solution, circle of knowledge. How about running Riz? Something Ooh. like that. <laughs> is that trademark? It is. Okay. I just trademarked it. Um, and, and so how do you know which coaching style to use for an athlete? So I always use a, there's a thing that East Germans and the Russians did and uh, they are not people, nice people, but they had, uh, they did understand <laughs> training and, uh, they have, uh, throughout an athlete's entire career, there's five stages of development. And ideally you have them go through each stage before the very end. So the, the five stages are train for fun. Number two is train to train. Number three is train to compete. Number four is train to win. And number five is re retire and go into coaching. So the first one train for fun. Train for fundamentals, and your focus is the ABCs, agility, balance, coordination, speed, and strength. That's for every single sport on the planet. You start there, right? And so this is where, before we had like organized sports, this is where I would play basketball, I'd swim, and soccer wasn't a thing, flag football, ride my mountain bike, or I guess it was a BMX bike at the time. You just did a whole bunch of different things and you became a pretty good you know, general athlete. So uh, Mike's, question from above the dynamic warm-up our dynamic warm-up involves uh, one to three miles of running then you come back and you do your leg swings front ways and sideways you do a skips you do b skips you do toy soldiers or straight leg you do butt kicks you do c skips you do karaoke's then you do strides and sometimes we'll do diagonal accelerations on grass barefoot sometimes we'll do 200s but basically it you a lot of people aren't going to know what all the skips are. You can look them up in, uh, what's her name? Sherry Hawkins, who made the World Championships team. She has some fantastic videos on that stuff. Mm -hmm. She can do it way better. I can't even do the stupid things. I know what to look for. But anyways, it, it, what you're doing with those drills is, one is um, encouraging people to get proper cadence and also improve their form. And also you're just working on the ABCs there, right? Yep. 
So if you have a elementary, junior high, or high school program, you have people just coming out, that should be the emphasis, right? The ABCs, dynamic warm-up, those types of things, right? Train to train is basically every top high school in California, I'm sure around the world, they're good every year because they run 11 months out of the year and the bad schools run four, right? They just simply run more. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that works in class. Like, how do you get Bs? You just show up to class, right? You don't need to be smart. You just need to show up, right? So that's where you learn in the train to train. You learn consistency over time pays off. Yeah. You learn that, okay, if I do my Sunday run, right, yeah. I tend to race better. And you get to the point where coach doesn't need to ask you, Connor, did you run on Sunday? At the end of the stage, yes, without question, you're, you've run on, on the weekend. Now, have you had some athletes over the years that were extremely consistent over the years and maybe not as talented, and then some really talented athletes that just weren't consistent? And yep. How did that usually end up long-term? Well, the most frustrating athlete you can have is someone who has a ton of talent and isn't consistent. They can race every once in a while, but over time, it doesn't work out. It's like everything else. I mean, you, you know, you can't, you can't aspire to be a millionaire and show up to work two days a week, right? It's just not going to work that way, right? You got to show up and work harder than anybody else. So, so if we have the train for fun, fundamentals, and then train to train and train to compete is what I tend to do. This is where you do uh, progressions, right? You, you kind of set up, you set up the, the season so that you have success in the biggest races, mm -hmm. right? With the idea being, like, you, it could be, j you need to get a Boston qualifier, so you're going to run calendar national, but you have to do certain types of training to get ready to run your qualifier. Then you recover and then you get ready for Boston Marathon, run your PR there. It could be Olympic trials, it could be nationals, anything like that. But you're doing, you're, you're manipulating things, right? You're doing the, the same basic stuff all year, but you put different importance on different things. So and well, are, how many, at, how many big events do you normally recommend an athlete might try to peak for each year? I don't know, three or four or five. Or four, it, okay. it also depends on, on the event. Right, like marathon, really, It's really maybe. hard to do a uh, top level 10K okay. a couple times a year, because yeah. one is the opportunities aren't there, right Right on the track. Yeah. Um, it just, it's difficult, okay. right? So that's train to compete. Train to win is what Bowerman is. It's what Union Athletics is. Yep. It's what On is. It's the 1% what, of the 1%. And if you don't get on the podium, you freaking failed. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, if Josh Kerr didn't get on the podium, yep. the Brooks Beast, you know, yeah, Atkins had a great season, right? But that's what all this is. You know, that's what Bobby Kersey is. Yeah. His job is to get people on the podium. If he doesn't do that. And not only on the podium, I, some of these athletes, if they get second or third, that's even a fail. That, yeah, that's a you fail, know, it's, right? It's winner. Winner lose, yeah. right? Um, and so, and this is where you get uh, a lot of things like full-time training, full-time masseuse, mm -hmm. Full-time rest, nutrition, unfortunately, performance-enhancing drugs come into play, right? Altitude training, you're trained full-time, and it's a job. Yeah. And no one cares how you're doing mentally. We'll get you a sports psychologist, but your job is to freaking run and run hard and do what I say. Your job as an athlete is not to think, right? right? Your job as an athlete is to run, right, and to win. And uh, I was golfing with Van Hoy and Angles, and uh, – Angles asked, what is the best attribute for a top athlete? And, and Van Hoy and I, in unison, said they don't think. Once they decide on their coach, that's it. Their job is to run and race and win. Right? Now, I'm not in that stage. That's a, that's a different thing altogether. But if you imagine Richtenheim, he's now in the retiring into coaching, right? So that's just the general progression of how you get people through uh, their career. Now, the reason I bring this up is people say, It'll come up to me and say, what should I be doing? And I ask about their background. And then based on where they're at, well, here's what we need to focus on. Yeah. And where you run into problems is when you have, and I see this in soccer, and I saw it in gymnastics with my daughter, you have these parents that are just screaming at their kids ab about winning, yeah. and they're years away from that stage, right? And you go, I mean, yeah, we're for Tiger Woods. We're for one guy on the planet, right? Or we're for Serena and, and you know. Um, it's just it's just a different ball game, right? right. Uh, but if you want to have the most success with the, your athletes, right? One is if your parents stay out of it, don't coach your kid. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about that. So, uh, you know, I'm I, my daughter's running pretty well at San Luis Obispo High School, and I I think I know everything about running. So, you know, I talk to her more and more about you know running and racing and everything. Life. No, running. We're just talking <laughs> okay, about running. Okay. And. Um, 
I'm too stupid to realize that the more I talk, the worse she races. Mm-hmm. Finally, at about a month into this, I pull her aside and I said, let's go to dinner. So we go to dinner and uh, I said, sweetie, I think I'm stressing you out. And she goes, you are with a giant F and some other letters stressing me out. Stop it. Stay away. And I haven't talked to her about running since. And same thing with my youngest on nice. pole vault. Although she did ask me to help her with uh, sprint training in the off season. Right. And I know nothing about sprint training. I mean, like real sprint training. Yeah. So I contacted Brian Fitzgerald, who's one of the best sprint coaches in California. Yeah. He laid out the program, and so she did his program, and I just timed. Nice. Yes. So, but, um, I mean, basically decent coaching is, it's basically, does it work? Is it easy to implement? Can any idiot do it? Right? And do I use it? Yeah. And so that, that you know, the, those stages of athlete development, you know, I don't even know if anybody finds this stuff interesting, but it helps me um, determine, you know, how to approach people on on the whole coaching thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the coaching, we'll, we'll keep getting into this because not many people know. How many years have you been coaching now? Uh, since the <coughs> early 90s. And that's with the Aggies? <laughs> yeah, at Cuesta College. I did a lot of, G- I thought it was going to yeah. be a J- JC coach, and then I started this, and that changed. Yeah. But, um yeah, I've had uh, three. And you, and you yeah. say you ha- you haven't necessarily been at the run or train to win, but you have had some athletes People on the that world, have cha- world championships. Sergio had a pretty Sergio, good run. I mean, he's doing great. He, made, he uh, Sergio Reyes, Reyes was twenty uh, uh, twelve U- U.S. national champion in the marathon. Two, yeah, two thirteen. I want to say. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But um, yeah, so uh, it's it's pretty basic stuff. But you know, I I tend to think in. Uh, Put things in boxes yeah. to make things easier for myself. Yeah. So basically, there's only you know like two workouts. Right. I mean, of significance, you're either doing tempo work or you're doing intervals. It is so simple when you look at you know a long run, two yeah. workouts a week, and you get some mileage in, and it's really just year after year. It's there's no quick. No, there's you, not a. Quick, you know, there are some people with genes, right. some talent that can get them to a certain level faster, but really, it's just time. And the other weird thing that you can't plan on is I've seen this with uh, a few athletes, particularly uh, Mark Conover, because he was my roommate, and right. I was training with him. And the 1988. 88, right, so right before that, Olympian. right, we trained together for Keller National, yep. and he ran 218, and we had a 60-mile-an-hour headwind. Wow. I'm not making that up. What does that feel like? Uh, it it sucks. So I, I was <laughs> in a group that was trying to qualify. I ran 222 yeah. um, and didn't qualify. But after that, Mark was on fire. When I say he was on fire, he couldn't, there's no workout he couldn't do. Yeah. And you just go, you look at him, you go, he's going to make the freaking team. He's going to win the whole damn thing. And no one was talking about him. And I'm just, and the guy looks, to, and the same thing happened with Chris Shilley, cross country monster. Like he showed up at a meet in Missoula, Missoula, Montana, and beat Ed Eyestone and Shannon Butler, who are the two top cross country and killed him. Right. And he couldn't go to nationals because he went to his ex wife's cousin's wedding. That's so he would have won. Priorities. Yeah, priorities, which is probably what nine might say. Anyways. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, geez. Okay, so we got into the coaching. Yeah. I think we, let, let's bring it back to shoes. Okay. That's what a lot of people are here to talk about. And our buyer, we've got the new Eric's Buying Closet. Closet, something like that. Yeah, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll work on the segment name. But this week, he's got a fun, it's supposed to be one shoe, but he, he brought two to us this right. week. We've got... Pearl Izumi, this is going to be the N2. This is the N1. And the N1. Right. And Go ahead. Well, Pearl Izumi. Yeah. They were on fire. When I first started working here, 2012, 2013, Pearl Izumi was like the shoe. They All were the on tra- the cusp. The, yeah, like the trail runners loved it. They were saying, this is the shoe. If you're going to go and race, they had a really great line. They were starting to work into the roadside. Just really cool product that was a little bit different, and it, it fit good. It felt good. Yeah. And then what happened? They just the, – the, the next line was insanely good. Yes. And they just pulled the plug. Poof. Poof. It went away. Gone. Right. And, um, yeah, the, everything was gone. Their yes. whole running line was gone. And we were upset, and we, we talked with ProZooming, like – is there any way we can bring this in exclusively? Yeah. And they're just, they they were done with running. And it was a shame because these shoes, uh, our buyer, Eric, this was his favorite trail shoe. Maybe even to this day, he still loves right. this shoe. But if you look at it, I mean, there's no stack on this thing. I think yeah. these are pretty much a zero drop kind of shoe. 
Um, well, well, Perlazumi had what they called a dynamic offset. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at, at the time, we didn't really know what that what the kind heck of that meant. meant. But yeah. it, it was supposed to be like a little bit more of what you're seeing with rockers today. And, you know, I don't know. There, it was interesting. It was pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, the colors and everything else was pretty spot on. Very. You, you could yeah. see this from a mile right. away. Right. And the other thing, too, is their apparel. I know we don't talk a lot about apparel, but their apparel was fantastic. Yeah. You know, the shorts and everything yeah. were just really well done. Right. So it's a bummer to see them yeah. go. You know, right? you, you saw pro athletes wearing these shoes. Yeah. They were really all in. And it, it is a shame to see what that brand might have been, but we'll never know. Well, I don't know. We Maybe have, it'll make a comeback. We got to see if Eric has a, a pair of the Zoot carbon plated shoes from, okay. I don't know. Maybe that's next ten- week. Yeah, we'll see if he has one of those. Okay. But I mean, there's all these brands that come and go. And yep. the tough part about the running industry is it's so competitive. Yes. Rarely do you see uh, anymore someone like a, a Hoka or an On who are like 10 years old that are now players, real players. And I think it's tough too with the cases like Pearl Azumi, yep. like Zoot, when they come from more of a try or they come from a background where they're focusing in something else. Right. And then they come to running and they're not all in on the running. We've seen this with Reebok. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's funny because Reebok started as a running company back right. in the 1800s. J.W. Foster, I think was the guy's name. They go a different route right. though and then they lose the way of they running. They lose the way, right. And Reebok does this time and again, right. Yeah. Um, but the connection between Reebok and Hoka do you know that connection? I do. Okay. So uh, Angel Martinez invented the very first women's athletic shoe, the freestyle for Reebok, because his wife was taking these classes, Jane Fonda <laughs> aerobics classes. You sound this is funny, but at the time, uh, high school girls would wear dress shoes to the gym. Wow. And basically, it was not a whole lot of sweating or anything like that. Then Title IX passed, and that running shoe, or just athletics for women, really started to take off. But... So Angel was president of Reebok when uh, they came out with the freestyle, became hugely popular. It took Adidas and Nike collectively six years to make their first women's shoe. And during that time, Reebok became the number one brand in athletic shoes. And that's when Phil Knight was gone and he came back, right? Um, But then Angel became president of Deckers and convinced Deckers to buy Hoka. And on the board of directors, he was the only person that wanted to buy Hoka. Everyone else thought it was a dumb idea because at the time you had Tony making the five fingers and that was all the rage, yeah. right? Nike Freeze and all that kind of stuff. Who the hell's going to want this clown shoe, right? Well, all the broken runners in the world wanted the clown shoes, right? So that's that's the connection there. And Anil then retired and lives in, I want to say, Ojai in a, in a mansion somewhere over there. <laughs> yeah. You know, a funny love guy. Anil. He's yeah, a good guy. He's a good dude. Okay. You brought up Phil Knight. Yeah. I think... We have to at least talk about it. It was a little bit of, uh, a little while ago, but I think we need to just go back and talk about the highlights of pre classic. You were the uh, running warehouse ambassador. You yeah. you showed up and you it, had a good time. Th- that was insane meat. And I, you know, another thing I'm, you know, Joe answers the internet. You know, I have all these kids or adults. I don't know who the hell these people are on Let's Run talking about how bad Eugene is. And I'll tell you what, I had a freaking awesome time, and I'm glad you weren't there, right? It, you know, how expensive it got to, to get there. I flew to Denver and then to Eugene and back to San Luis Obispo. It cost $450. I find a, found a place to stay for $100 a night. Uh, Leo, who works for me, uh, was also John Capriotti's best man at his first wedding. He went, he found an Airbnb um, uh, studio for $62 a night, right? Food wasn't expensive. Everyone says there's homeless people everywhere. Well, there's no homeless people by the track where I was at or the golf courses where I were at or the restaurants where I was at. But the meat was insane. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact that they split it up into two, two days at two hours each yeah. was fantastic. You know, and then, I, you know, the other thing is, is track and field is, is a sport where you can walk down to the track after day one. And I'm talking to Jenna Rinke, who got second in the 800 the next day. Bryce Hoppel, right? I meet Christian Coleman. Right. Um, I spent a ton of time talking to Justin Knight, found out what he's up to. Right. I mean, just um, saw Mike Conley, uh, talked to him for a while. It's just you just see people everywhere. Yeah. The, the pre- previous pre Fontaine I went to, I met uh, I think Mo. I met Ryan Croce's grandmother. You know, it's just stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, seeing two two world records yep. and then going into the airport and I'm sitting talking, uh, waiting for my flight and talking to one of the board of directors at Drake Reilly's. 
He says, Mondo's over there. So I go over to talk to Mondo, and he's sitting at the counter in the restaurant, and he's on his phone, and he's not looking up at me. He says, hey, congratulations yesterday. He goes, thanks. And he's still looking at his phone. I said, my daughter's pole vault coach coached your dad. He goes, he looks like he goes, Jan Johnson? I go, yep, Jan Johnson. <laughs> I said, can I get a photo? He said, of course. So I got a photo with Mondo, but it's just stuff like that, right? But probably the, the coolest thing was on my flight to Denver, uh, there's a lady that's sitting to the right. I, I got the dreaded middle seat. You know, but whatever. I needed to get to Eugene. So I take the middle seat, and this guy sits next to me, and he looks like an athlete. You know when you see people and they look like athletes? Yeah. This guy looked like an athlete. Specimen. Yeah. And I said, so are you competing this weekend? He goes, yes. I said, what event? Long jump. I said, how'd you do at the Worlds? He goes, silver medal. Okay. Um, Jamaican guy. So then uh, this other gentleman walks up and says, I think you're in my seat to the silver medal. So the guy looks at you. Oh, yeah, sorry. So he goes up, and this gentleman sits down next to me, and I'm making small talk. I said, uh are you going to the meet? He goes, yeah. I said, are you a fan? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan. I said, hey, are you a coach? He said, yeah, I used to coach. And I said, were you an athlete? He goes, yes, I was. I got the bronze medal in the 110 hurdles in the 1960 Olympics, and I got the gold in 1964. Hayes Jones. Ooh. So he became my best buddy. So nice. we were hanging out together. He's telling me some great stories. Right. And one of them was um, at that time to compete in the Olympics, you had to be an amateur athlete. You couldn't accept money at all. So in 61, Hayes graduated from Eastern Michigan, got a job in Detroit as a teacher, and they asked him to be the head basketball and track coach. Well, he said, okay. So him being an Olympic medalist, he was all over the local papers. Well, Avery Brendage, who was in charge of the IOC and really a dick, um, he saw the article, contacted the head of the AAU, which was in charge of track and field at the time, and said, if Hayes continues to work at this school he's not competing in the 64 olympics so he had to quit and his family had to support him for the next three years while he trained he got the gold medal who put the medal around his neck avery brendage yeah i said what do you want to do he said i want to punch the guy right in the face but anyways i'm supposed to go to atlanta here in a couple of weeks and uh i don't hang out with him you know take him by our facility there and stuff like that but really sweet man you know he was sitting next to me and uh eating chocolate. And I said, you really like your chocolate? He says, I just eat chocolate on the weekends. I said, you got a lot of discipline. He goes, how do you think I made it on the podium, young man? <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm looking to my right, and there's a Budapest World Championships water bottle in mm -hmm. a gal, gal wearing ultras. And I looked, and it's Kerry Goucher. Now, is the first thing when you see someone, do you look at the shoes? Because that's I what I do. I do. I look at the shoes. And you, you judge just a little bit. Well, a little bit. And I'm thinking, does she work for Ultra? And then the Budapest thing, I don't think so. And then I looked, and it's Carrie Goucher. So I started talking to Carrie Goucher. Like, Carrie Goucher on my right, and then Hayes on my left, and we're just talking about stuff. So it was a pretty cool flight, right? I mean, it's just uh, all that kind of stuff. And then I met another guy. I, met, I forget the guy's name, but he gets sixth in the world championships in the discus. And he is a big human. He's like 350 pounds, but he's not fat. He's just big. Yeah. Yeah. When you see people like that, you go, holy moly. Just yeah. the nicest guy, but ooh, big. big, big. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was riveting, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> that, you know, I, I, I think we might have outdone episode number one. Well, I, let's see. I've just been hearing, it, it's not official, yeah. but we might be the number one fastest growing running podcast once, in the game. Once it gets published, yes. You know, I yes. that's just what I've been, I've right. been told. So well, I want to thank everyone for visiting. And uh, as all podcasts are required by the threat of plantar fasciitis, <laughs> you need to like, subscribe, and actually in the comment section, if you ask us questions, we'll do our best to answer them uh, or get someone who actually knows what they're talking about to answer your question. Yeah, that's probably yeah. more likely. Yeah, exactly. So for our next episode, what are we going to do? Oof. Why does this shoe exist? Oh, Right? Because you look and you go, what, what, what were these people thinking on this shoe? And the other part of it is naming structure. Yes. Right. Not everything oh. is a pro. Oh, right. Well, or elite for some pro. of these brands, it is. It, it is. And it's just <laughs> like, can somebody, uh, man, it's just like. And, and the, the people at home, they don't see the behind the scenes. But when you hear, you know, it's just crazy well, how. How hard can this be? It's not rocket science. No. Um, anyways, we'll talk about that right. next time. A lot more to come. Okay. Got it. All right. Thanks, guys.